And I'm going to ask you to give me yep. kind of your sound bite responses because I also want to respect your time here. Okay. So, sure. so you could go into obviously depth on these, but maybe say, here's just one reason why I'm not convinced by this. Uh, so let's take a very serious thinker like Roger Penrose, who said there could be other solutions for design for which we are not yet aware and cannot verify. Um, you're in a court of law. You have uh, a lot of evidence presented. Hmm. Was it a natural cause or was there malfeasance? You find the bloody knife. You hmm. under uncover the uh, the motive. You identify the opportunity. You have eyewitness testimony. Now you're asked to render a verdict. Well, maybe there'll be new evidence that will come along someday and you'll find that you were wrong, but at some point we have to make decisions based on the evidence that's in front of us. That's a kind of materialism of the gaps argument that says, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we have a, that's I remember good. when Anthony Lou, still in his atheistic manifestation, yeah. debated uh, um, uh, Alvin Plantinga on the BBC, I think it was. Wow. And Lou said, well, there's a presumption of atheism, which he could get away with saying, uh, talking to lesser minds. But Plantinga just laughed at him and said, no, there's no presumption of atheism. You've got atheism, you've got theism, you've got other competing metaphysical systems. You've got to make a case for your perspective as much as anybody else. Now, next go. question. You I know, love it. And so there's no, so a lot of this idea that, well, we'll just wait because, you know, there's a, uh, hmm. you know, well, couldn't it be later on? We'll find out something new. Well, yeah, maybe. But, but when you get a, a, a formidable body of evidence that's all pointing in one direction, and then when each new point piece of evidence continues to point in the same direction, at some point it's reasonable to render a verdict. Uh, it can be you can say from a philosophical standpoint, it's not absolute. We're not absolutely certain because we're never absolutely certain. It's provisional in the sense that okay. science is always provisional. But the best explanation we have is that the uh, best we can tell the universe had a beginning. The best we can tell is it was finely tuned. The best we can tell there's digital code in cells. Uh, now, what do we make of that? And I think the best explanation of all of that is is, is theistic. I do agree at some point the evidence does demand a verdict. So I'm with you on that one, my friend. Two more. It's an Great response. The family, right? <laughs> my mom came up with it, interestingly enough. But that that's right? a whole yeah, she did. That's a that's a whole nother story. So here's one another objection that we'll hear is when you argue the universe is designed, so much of the universe is inhospitable to life. So it seems like it's not designed if only a small, narrow amount can actually support life. You, you can turn that one either way. You can think, as Carl Sagan okay. says, this mites on a plum in the remote corner of an insignificant solar system in the remote corner of an insignificant galaxy, <laughs> in a vast universe of two trillion other galaxies. Or you can appeal to divine extravagance and to say we're the special place, that, that we're the mm. privileged planet. I think that's largely mm. an aesthetic judgment. I don't think you can settle the argument about what mm. we see as evidence design on our planet with our with our species with li the life on our planet and why god chose if, if you accept the design hypothesis you can ask the further question why god chose to make so much else that may not where there may not be life mm. um i, I just think it's a, a wonderful beautiful fascinating universe and uh, and th that such extravagance was expended in the process of making us to enjoy it hmm. says something about the infinite resources it, uh, available to the creator. But that's a theological that's right. uh, speculation or reflection, but so is the claim that God wouldn't have done it this way and therefore hmm. it's false. I think we have to deal with the more primary evidence of design or no design. The universe does not, um, you know, in Dawkins's framework, um, he says the universe has exactly the properties we should expect if at bottom there's no purpose, no design. Wait mm -hmm. a minute. No, there's ample evidence of design and the fine tuning and the digital code and the complex information storage transmission and processing system. All of these things are what you would expect if an agent had been at work, maybe one with uh, some uh, uh, 
skill in computer science and engineering even, um, or, or, or knowledge of the principles that underlie such endeavors, um, it's not what you'd expect from blind, pitiless indifference, which is the rest of his quote. So I, I, I think on, on Bayesian grounds, the universe we see is much more to be expected from a mm. design perspective than from a no design perspective. But that doesn't mean that there aren't still questions about why this than that, why this yeah, that's rather fair. than that. But I think the primary evidence that we need to look at uh, points strongly in the design direction. And I can easily think of theological explanations for for extinction or uh, or why there is no life on other planets that we've discovered yet. And maybe there will be life on other planets. That's interesting. The atheist will turn the possibility of life on other planets uh, into a, a, an anti-theistic argument as well. When I think, you know, on, on biblical grounds, the Bible's completely neutral on and agnostic on that question. We just don't know, mm. you know. So mm. it, like, a lot turns on that theologically one way or another, but it's a possibility, you know, so. Excellent. Last one for you that I heard, in fact, just yesterday or the day before talking about this with some folks. Well, if the universe had different laws of physics and constants, then other forms of life could have or would have evolved to match those different parameters. Um, <clears throat> that objection can be formulated different ways. Sometimes the formulations lack some precision. Uh, the first thing I'd say is that we have to explain ultimately what we're trying to explain is what we see around us, and that's life as we know it. Um, okay. And so it's easy to posit other um, chemistries or other physics that would produce life, but what we know is that the basic laws of physics that we encounter are not by themselves set up to allow for life. You need the fine-tuning of the initial conditions, the fine-tuning of the, the constants of physics, um, you need these other contingent factors to be just right. And that's one of the ways that we detect the activity of agency in our experience generally. Uh, so the life as we know it seems to have required fine tuning, which seems therefore to imply intelligent design. Hmm. Now, the other postulations about what could generate other chemical bases of life, for example, silicon-based life, are, are chemically implausible. It happens that carbon uniquely has, it, it has unique properties that no other atom has, and we need fine-tuning to get carbon. That was the, the, the Hoyle speculated about, about silicon-based life for a while and, and, finally, and finally gave up on it. Um, because it's just, it, silicon is, you know, close to carbon in the periodic table. It has similar, some similar properties, sure. but it's not nearly close enough. Um, but there's something else to say about this. It's, uh, there, there's a variation on this objection. Lawrence Krauss made it in the exchange I had with him in the journal Inference, where yeah. he said, well, the, it's not that the, um, that life arose because there was prior fine tuning. It's that the evolutionary process accommodated that prior fine tuning to produce life. It, it, life evolved in accord with the fine tuning that was already there. And so there's really nothing to explain. This is like Lincoln's old saw about, isn't it great that a man's legs are long enough for his, uh, to reach the ground? Um, well, of course they're going to reach the ground because there's a gravitational force that ensures <laughs> that it will. All so right. by analogy, Krauss is arguing, well, um, of course life evolved consistent with the fine tuning that we see because the evolutionary process would only work in accord with the fine tuning that was already there. It would, it, the evolution is taking <clears throat> advantage, if you will, or functioning, operating within a matrix of already established finely tuned parameters. And <clears throat> it's going to produce life because it's the evolutionary process. And so that's what explains the origin of life. The fine tuning is neither here nor there. We had to evolve in accord with the fine tuning. But there is a really obvious problem with that in that you would not, evolution itself will not ensue. There's no possibility of an evolutionary process 
apart from prior fine tuning, a pri for yep. exquisitely probable prior fine tuning. Well said. If the cosmological constant is not finely tuned, the universe is either going to blow apart or we're going to get a black hole. And we're not going to have any biologically relevant fine, uh, evolutionary process taking place in a black hole or in a, in a universe that's been subjected to heat death. Um, we won't get rocky planets. Um, so just mm. that one parameter uh, has to be finely tuned. The same with the, the initial conditions of the in, initial entropy fine tuning and the, and the, the mass of the core. A lot of the fine tuning, we, we won't get even basic chemistry past the helium atom without fine tuning of many parameters. So evolution presupposes prior unexplained improbable fine tuning. Mm. It doesn't explain mm. the origin of life in accord with it.